Here we go. Uh, Universal logo just coming on here. We're going to do a, a defense commentary for the 1998 Gus Van Sant version of Psycho. Um, what's really funny, ever since I saw this film in well, 1998, I've always been really sort of endlessly fascinated by just how sort of polarizing this film is. I mean, you don't really hear very many people stick up for it full stop, but it's so... I, and I know the original is obviously a Stone Cold classic. There's no sort of getting away from that. But with a lot of remakes, I feel that um, it's understandable why uh, they get slagged off. And here we go straight from the off. Here we go into the Soul Bass sort of titling. Uh, and I'm going to be sort of ping-ponging back and forth here because everything happens kind of so fast. But um, yeah, with a lot of remakes... Um, they kind of do their own thing or go off on tangents. Uh, but a lot of people always sort of complain about this, is that it's a shot-for-shot shot remake, which A, it is, and B, it kind of isn't. Like, even something as simple as this, where I know it seems so arbitrary and so sort of, yet yeah, so what? But, like, obviously the original is in black and white. Somebody somewhere had to choose the colour for these lines that are going across the screen. Somebody actually choose the co- choose. Somebody chose the colour as green, and that where that might be such a s- tiny little element to this film, where even though they have kind of basically used the same scripts, they have basically used the same score, they have basically used the same set. Every little element in this film, they had to come up with ways of making it their own. Which again, it's kind of having your cake and eating it in the sense that, um, you know, like Gus Van Sant said, well, if I don't remake it shot for shot, then it's not a remake. I'm changing it. Uh, so, but at the same time, I felt like that, um, you know, watching the making of, reading interviews and things like that, that as much as they wanted to do it shot for shot and just keep it as identical, there's so much of their own stamp on this film. And not just, you know, really, you know, not just like the age in colour, which kind of always makes me laugh that, like, people talk about oak filming in colour. Like, that, that suddenly makes the only difference to the film, that it's shot in colour. Uh, like, take this shot here. Uh, it's a helicopter shot flying through the city. And this is one of those shots where, if you just watch it, if it's on, you know, if you're just watching it, not really paying that much attention, or, you know, it's just on in the background, you're not really paying oh, yeah, it's a helicopter shot. But, like, literally, it's, like, flying around the corner to this building. And then the uh, building there, or oh, there, he it, actually t- uh, time stamps it as well as 1998, something which the original doesn't do. Uh, it literally flies into this, and I was watching it the other day, flies into this building, this helicopter shot. And the most amazing thing is, though, it is pretty damn seamless when you think this goes from a being, you know, outside, on location, um, you know, a helicopter, you do see it on the making of uh, a side view of the helicopter flying into this building. And then morphs into a shot from the set on the sound stage and i mean you know not, I, you know this is like i even though i've seen this film loads of times i never think of this film i mean cg in it you know i know it's like only a morphing effect and it's, you know using not necessarily a computer generated image but it's using a computer to seamlessly go from one shot to another of which like i say that shot wasn't accomplished in the original and then it cuts to this scene, and if you're actually watching the film without me rambling all over it, you can hear people in the other rooms, like uh, up to you know, up to whatever they're doing. <laughs> but that's really funny that like uh, like that like, little close-up shot of that fly, where again I know it's like one of these like sort of um, things where on the one thing, oh, it's a little bit pointless, you know, they're putting these extra shots in there, they're doing these little extra sound design elements or morphing elements. And and, and on the one hand, it doesn't change the film that much. But that said, I really do like anything that's kind of restrictive, but at the same time, to be creative or to uh, sort of be original, which is kind of ironic, talking about like a, a shot-for-shot remake, is that, like I say, every scene, every sequence has got a very distinct uh, personality stamp on this film. That it's not just like they took the script and said, "Let's film it exactly." Um, like I say, just that a sound element design. If you can hear people in the other, it, ironically, it starts in a motel uh, or hotel, I should say. Um, but uh, 
yeah, it, the, the, it just gives that extra flavour to it, that extra character. And I, I really do think that a lot of people watching this film, yeah, it's just remakes, I go. And, and and that's what it is. But I, and again, I think this is something that de- definitely is worthy of mention. By uh, the time the film got to this point, it wasn't like this film got remade in you know, the mid seventies, you know, ten, fifteen years after the original Psycho came out. By this, the time this film had come out, there'd been a Psycho two, a Psycho three, a Psycho four. I, I read in an um, Empire magazine, which is a British magazine, they gave away these free movie almanacs, and uh, and they were all about loads of different movie facts. And and uh, it's the only place I've ever read it. So you know, take this with a pinch of salt. It said um, uh, Anthony Perkins died while making Psycho Five, so in theory they were going to make a Psycho Five. Then uh, there was um, a TV pilot called Bates Motel. Um, that sort of came and went. Then this came out, and now we've got the brilliant um, Freddie Highmore, Vera Farmiga series, Bates Motel, which is awesome. But people still talk about this Psycho 1998 as if there was the original Psycho and this. And this is somehow desecrated. Oh, there's it. And in there, there we go, from the next scene, there is Gus Van Sant's director cameo next to... Um, uh, somebody who looks like Alfred Hitchcock and again uh, I think a lot of people don't realise that there that was all green screen uh, outside that window looks really great though and this is one of these things where this film's got the best uh, rear projection I've ever seen if it wasn't for the making of I would never have realised that it was uh, a lot of it was done on sound stages or you know there was so much sort of green screen CG technology in it in inverted commas um, and that's when this uh, sequence was being filmed. Pat, Hitt- Pat, excuse me, say Pat Hitchcock, uh, Alfred Hitchcock's daughter, was on the set because uh, she was the character with, that was played by uh, Pat Hitchcock in the original. Uh, and, and so there's got so much energy from the original film in this film. I really uh, sort of think that, like, say, you know, and fair enough, you know, like say most people, you know, just think, oh, Shop Shop Remake, I'm never going to watch it, you know, watch it once, never watch it ever again. Be- because I've watched this film about 30, 40 times, if not more, I saw it at the cinema, I've got a DVD, I'm doing the commentary off the uh, VHS. Uh, there's a brilliant making of on this after called Psychopath, uh, where it talks to, you know, uh, uh, Hilton Green, I think that's his name, sorry, my mind just um, should have done some better notes. Um, uh, anyway, the assistant uh, director of um, the original Psycho uh, seems to be um, in a lot of different uh, parts of the making of, and like I think, like they were sort of asking him about different things. Um, uh, Joseph Stefano, who did the original screenplay, uh, who Ralph Macchio played in. Um, the film they made about Hitchcock, it was called Hitch. Um, uh, uh, yeah, Josie Stefan, who wrote the original screenplay, he did the screenplay for this, like just updated it and tweaked it slightly. Um, I think the script uh, continuity uh, people from the original worked on this. It was filmed on the original uh, set at Universal. They built the new Bait House in front of the old Bait House, which you see on the making of, which is kind of redundant for anybody who's seen the making of, but you know, I guess a lot of people might not have done it. It's definitely worth checking out because I think it puts a whole new sort of perspective on this film that, uh, like uh, I know I've said it ten times already, but I, I really do feel that with this film, that people just think that, I don't know what they think that, like, these new things just all built themselves, and the clothes they were wearing were the same clothes that the original actors wore. That there was no costume design, or there was no production design. I, I think I don't know what people think about this film. That they like say, "Oh, shop 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 remake," as if that was it. As if like you know, they didn't screen test actors. They didn't do like you see on the making of. Evans Vaughan, how they decide, trying to decide how to have his hair, where, if he's going to have a beard, uh, you know, what kind of clothes Han Hedge is going to be wearing. Uh, you know, all these different little elements uh, went to uh, handhold the camera, went to put in another shot, uh, um, how to record the music, you know, sort of keep the production kind of almost like it was in the 60s, but sort of do like a 
again, you know, because it's the 90s, after all, a, a contemporary sort of score, uh, you know, sort of do it in stereo or having, you know, channel switching and things like that. And that's nothing as well that, like, um, I'm one of the few people in the world that doesn't really like stereo that much. I think it, you know, it just really distracts me. I just think, oh, oh look what they've done there. They've made the sound of a dog barking coming out of the left speaker. Or, oh, that's cool. Oh, you can hear that aircraft going from one side to the other. Or audio you know, speeches coming from the front or something like that. Uh, so like I'm not I'm not a big fan of like you know 5.1 7.1 I just think it's really gimmicky. But in this, when I saw this at the cinema, the bit where Marion Crane's driving down the road and she can hear all the different voices, uh, they were coming out of all different speakers, and it really it one of the few times where I thought that was it really felt like like sort of it wasn't just oh this is coming out the left. It it felt like a real cool design choice, a real interesting concept to have all these voices bouncing around the cinema. And I think, like I say, it's one of those things where uh, that looks a lot like Laurie Strode's type of in Halloween. Uh, oh, that's another that that bird I'm sorry for. It's, uh, maybe a, a, a reference there to the birds. <laughs> that's nothing as well. Little, again, little things like um, when you see in Norman's room later on, uh, there's a poster of um, an aeroplane called the Bluebird. And I, I like little moments like that where, again, it's just such a s- subtle, like I think an answer says on the making of, they just tweak everything. And like I say, if, you know, like I say, if this is just on TV, you go, oh, yeah, it's just, just just the same film over again, which it, which it is. But at the same time, I feel like so much was put into this movie that it kind of shows people up for what they are. they like, A, they've not seen this film. Or they've just watched this film with the blinkers on, going, not as good as the original, blah, blah, blah. And then just not just realising these really beautiful touches on this movie that, like, say, like, it, even on a dress, I never would have noticed if I'd not for the making of, but the buttons match the shower curtain in the Bates Motel. I mean, it's like, you know, it's such a... I know everything nowadays is meta, and everybody loves deconstructing movies, and everybody thinks, oh, big movie, nerd, and that. But I, I really love stuff like that. And and this as well. I mean, like I say, you watch the making of, and I assume this shot here is on location. Uh, and then when you see the shot of uh, Anne Hatch looking through a um, handbag, I forget, like a driving license and stuff. When you see that on the making of... It's all rear screen. It's all. It, I think it's purple screen. It's not even green or blue screen. It's purple screen, which is cool. I never noticed that before. I think on the number plate there, I noticed that the other day. It's nine nine nine. I don't know if the number plate is that in the original. Uh, I know her number plate ANL uh, is the same. Uh, ANL seven oh nine because uh, that gets mentioned. And that's another thing as well about this film where. I feel like they, they had such good fun making it that like they were deciding like what elements to change, what elements to keep, and like what little words to change and things. But I really love in this that I've read that any mistakes that they were in the original, like little goofs and I've spoken about what mistakes are, but any kind of any error they spotted, they they carried them over into this version, and I kind of love stuff like that. There again, you know, what a perfect sort of way of thinking. Oh, well, we could change their mistakes and things, but now we'll keep we'll we'll keep we'll keep them in. I think that's pretty cool. And and like what a few people said on the making of as well that like, um, uh, you know. Like, uh, if this was like a play, like something like Othello, it's been done loads of times, you know, and, you know, like uh, Hamlet's been done loads of times. So why not? Why not use a screenplay again? I mean, you know, like, say, I mean, it would have been fascinating to sort of even, ch- you know, keep it the same. But, like, say, they could have made the shower scene gory, because I think in the original book, um, I think she has a head cut off or something like that. You know, so they could have almost done that, or instead of a knife, I think, in the, in the book, I think it's an axe. So they could have, like, um, they could have done that, which could have been, like, there, like, all that's front rear screen projection, as far as I, uh, I can gather from the makeup, like, there, that's, like, that shot there, just out of a car, that, that was done on a set. Does not look like it at all. And I, I've been watching films ever since I've been a little kid, I can't think of a film where I know it's rear screen projection, but it just doesn't look like it. I mean, you know, I know, like, say, you know, 
it always looks so fake and in films like Airplane they take the mick out of it so spectacularly by you know having footage of like cowboys and Indians behind them and you know people falling off bikes and things but I think 99.9% of people watching this if if they hadn't seen the making of like I had or followed the production of this movie they would just go yeah that's real uh, you know, obviously that shot from the window is obviously some kind of composite shot, but this kind of ping ponging back and forth between real real projection, and you literally can't tell if you didn't know. That's such amazing filmmaking. Like people like Chris Doyle, like the cinematographer, and this is like another element of this film that always makes me laugh. Is it's like, yeah, fair enough. You know, the original, the original is amazing. No, no twist. But love the original. Loved it ever since I was a kid. I saw a digital print of it um, about five years ago. Um, it's an art cinema. One of my best, uh, favourite cinema experiences of all time, watching the original on the big screen. Perfect. Um, uh, but one uh, part of this film that always makes me laugh is, you know, if you like the original and don't like this, I mean, really don't like it on any level whatsoever, it makes no sense whatsoever to me because... Uh, you know, fair enough. If you don't like the film, full stop. If you don't like this version or the original, okay, that's fine. You know, some people don't like horror. You know, just some people don't like these kind of films. That's that's fine. I've got no no problem with that at all. But if you like this version and you don't like the original, well, that doesn't make sense. And then if you like the original but don't like this version, well, that doesn't make sense because which elements do don't you like from this film? And it's like say either way, if you like this film or the original and vice versa, it's like we go well. In the original on this one, is it good actors in nearly every role? Yeah. I mean, in this one, you've got Anne Etch, Vince Vaughn, uh, William H. Macy, uh, uh, Viggo Mortensen. In the original, you've got um, Anthony Perkins, um, Janet Lee. You know, just just across the board, you've got you know all these great actors. And then you go, well, um, who wrote the screenplay for this film? Oh, Joseph Stefano. Who wrote the screenplay for the original? Joseph Stefano. Uh, is it basically the same story in each film? Yes. Who did the music in the original? Bernard Herrmann. Who did the music in this one? Uh, Stephen Bartek and Danny Elfman using his score. So essentially, it's the same music. And then you think, oh, well, what about the production design? Production design immaculate in both movies. They even use the same sets. You know, it's like you know, if you think about it, it was, uh, you know, partly filmed on the Universal backlot once you get to the Bates Motel. Uh, you know, so it's like, well, the sets are. In essence, the same. You know, I know the Bates House was changed, and I love the original Bates House. I think this new Bates House, though, is almost, it's, I can't believe I'm saying it, uh, excuse me, is almost better. But literally behind the set of this new Bates House is the old Bates House. So you've got like, so that element is almost exactly the same. So it's like one of these things where, yeah, sure, preference is one thing. Uh, you know, you could eat quite easily, you know, not like this one or, or vice versa. And I've said it ten times already. But that's fine to me. Yeah, if you really love the original, but sort of think, I can sort of cope with this one or, you know, I'll, I'll watch it if it's on kind of thing. Yeah, that's fine to me. But these people are like, this is a piece of shit. It's the worst one I've ever seen. It was the most pointless thing I've ever made. It's like, I don't know... A, if people are saying that just to say it, or, well, you could say, yeah, it is pointless, but what what films aren't pointless? How many films throughout the course of a year really need to get made? And it's not like, say, when you go around somebody's house and you're watching, like, oh, you know, old Fritz Lang movies, or, you know, some, like, you know, a neo-realism film, or some film about politics or something. You go around somebody's house and nearly always watching, like, Taken 2 or something, or, you know... Transformers, you know, uh, Age of Extinction or something like that. You know, it's not like so. It always kind of makes me laugh. People go, "Oh, it's pointless." Th- this film was made. It, to be quite honest, most films that people watch, they should never have been made anyway. You know, and it's not like, oh, just say this film. I don't know how much it costs. Just say it costs forty million to make. It's not like instead of making this film, they would have give it to some kind of cancer charity or just give it to. You know, feed the homeless. It would have been made. Another film would have been made, and it would have been tr- completely forgotten about. So it's not like, say, um, I just I don't know what the uh, what people hope to achieve by sort of really slagging off this film. I mean, even the other week, I heard, I think it was uh, Mark Hermo said something about it on like his film show, and it always gets mentioned. It's a bit like the Phantom Menace. It's really strange that. Uh, it's you know to you know paraphrase Kevin Smith, there's there's films that, that's 
but supposedly people don't like but can't stop talking about. And if you think this is 17 years later since like this film came out, I, I really do find it like I like this film. So to me talking about it or watching it, well, I like it, I enjoy it, so that makes sense to me there, you know. But films that I don't like, and, and there's the very few to be fair, but films that I don't care for very much, like, like I've never really liked Jumanji very much. You know what? I don't watch it. So it's like one of these things where, like, I don't understand how you could watch this this film 17 years ago, think, yeah, I don't like it. Then just constantly keep talking about it, constantly keep bringing it up on message boards, constantly keep bringing it up on the radio, constantly keep tweeting about it or posting about it on the internet. Every day, basically. It's like, well, I just don't understand. Uh, like, and, the, and the Phantom Menace is a perfect example. Where, oh, I hate the Phantom Menace. Okay, fine, people don't like the Phantom Menace. But why keep talking about it over and over and over again? That's like, oh, I don't like that. Well, don't watch it. Don't, don't, you know, it's not like, you know, especially this film. What's really interesting about the Psycho remake, because I like this film. I mean, you know, if I see, like, you know, in a shop or something, I'll, it'll catch my eye or something. But it's not even like, I can't remember the last time I saw it on TV or, you know, I can't remember the last time it was like rammed down somebody's throat. So it's like one of these things where if you don't like this film, it's pretty easy to have forgotten about it by now. Like, say, the original is still far and away regarded as, you know, the one to watch. And even like, say, Psycho 2 people love and, you know, even like, say, Bates Motel, you know, that like if you think like you know, like I love Bates Motel, but nobody says, oh, it's a, it's a rip off of the original. I know it's only got the same title, but you think that new version of Bates Motel could have been called anything? It could have been called Norman, Norman Bates, Bates, uh, yeah, I, or it could have been called Psycho or something, or oh, the Orange Psycho, the Origin or something. But it was called Bates Motel. There was already something called Bates Motel. So it, it, it you know, it's all this thing of you know. It's like what goes around comes around kind of thing. So it is kind of completely fascinating to me that um, this film still to this day takes so much shit. And like I said, like I said, you know, five ten minutes ago, that I can't see the elements that people don't like about this because it's so similar to the original. That, like, I say, you know, fair enough if they use the same scripts, the same sets, but got shit actors in it. They go, oh yeah, fair enough. The actors are terrible. It's, it's like. I can't see there's a weak element in this film. And not just even subjectively, like, on paper. Like I was going to say about Chris Doyle. You look at, like, the cinematographer Chris Doyle. You look at all his other films. I mean, oh, he's amazing. Oh, he's the oh, best cinematographer ever. All of a sudden working on this film. It's like, oh, fuck Chris Doyle. And it's like, oh, Gus Van Sant before he made this. Oh, he did Goodwill Hunting. And he did this film and that film. Oh, he's the best director ever. He made this film. Suddenly a load of old shit. You know, Viggo Mortensen and, you know, Vince Vaughn and Anach and William H. Macy. Before this film, oh, they're the best actors ever, the best, oh, they're amazing, incredible, did this film, load of shit. Danny Elfman, oh, he's incredible, Simpson, blah, 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 did this film, load of shit. It just doesn't, um, you know, fair enough, you know, you might get one element that just falls under par or doesn't live up to expectations, but like, it's like every element all came and stuck, all in one movie, all at once. It's like... Yeah, right. Uh, oh, and like I say, here we go. Let's say this is literally where the original was filmed. I mean, how many times can you say that in a remake? It's like, say, even something like, say, the 1990 I'd say version of Night Living Dead, a screenplay by George Romero, uh, you know, directed by, like, you know, Tom Savini, who, you know, who's been with Romero for years. And even that, you know, was a different form or something like that. This is literally where the original movie was filmed. I mean, you know, so people could watch this and go, oh, all over the shit. It's a, a literally identical to the original. And like I say, you know, you know, I say it might be, like I say, I'm probably going to say about 50 times before the country ends, but yeah, you could say it's pointless. But, well, I mean, that's a great shot of the house. I think that's the shot from the back of the um, the soundtrack, uh, which is kind of, and again, like I say, talk about meta, though. Uh, that's one of the first times I realised that house was quite scary when I looked at the back of the soundtrack I was like yeah that's pretty freaky uh, but um, yeah talk about meta there's one part later on where um, Marion's sister she's got headphones on which I've got to admit is a little bit stupid you know she's got Luke man we're in the future uh, uh, but um, one of the songs she's listening to is Rob Zombie what's kind of cool about that to me sorry I think it's Steve's <coughs> oh dear no, oh, Steve's on commentary, sorry. That's all I can do. Um, where were we? Oh, yeah, uh, Rob Zombie. Um, I think a lot of people sort of, you know, you know but like, yeah, everybody's like, say, looked at it from a meta point of view. 
is that like Rob Zombie remade uh, Halloween one and two, like literally remade Halloween one and two, and, and so she's listening to like Rob Zombie, and this is like a remake of that. And I, I I do kind of, even though sometimes I think it's a little bit pretentious to sort of um, to really be that metro about stuff. I think sometimes you just can't help but think, wow, there is so much deliberately put into this film, and then just. When they put Rob Zombie on the soundtrack to this, I bet they didn't think, you know, well, ten years after this, Rob Zombie's going to remake one of the most iconic horror films ever made. So it's like, I, I do kind of like that. There's some kind of, um, there's a nice, just a little bit of, probably the wrong word, but I feel like it's serendipitous. There's kind of a nice little um, bit of calm. It's, again, that's complete, I'm completely using the wrong word, but I just feel like there's, there's some nice energy going on there. That, you know, again, they put a bit of Rob Zombie in there. It's kind of funny. What's funny there, because I was going to have this as like, um, I was going to have this as like a short 10 minute sort of video where I was going to edit it and sort of, I was kind of going to do a script too, because I don't really ever it, it sort of do that very often, like, um, um, sort of. Uh, and then I realized, wow, that's going to be, you know, I'll, I'll have to sort of work my way up to that because I'll have to sort of figure out how to. Uh, memorize my script or have it on some kind of auto cue or dummy cards or something. <laughs> so uh, I've got it's only um, a few paragraphs, but I've got my script here. So I thought may as well get some use out of what I've done before. Uh, where, oh, wait a minute. Um, I put this is where it started. Um, it's 17 years later. And Dave is going to defend the Psycho remake. Then I had the idea, why? Why not? Um, a lot of people say that it's pointless to remake such a classic film. How many people would try to say the same to musicians at the proms playing their Paganini composition, or a painter trying to replicate the skills of the old masters like Bernard, or a carpenter making a solid oak table using the techniques passed down over the generations? It's not just a remake, a copy of something else. In a funny sort of way, it's almost a totally unique film, using a previously filmed screenplay, but updated slightly by the original writer, and filmed again, shot on the exact same sets as the original but updating the, updating the main set piece in the Bates house. The fact that it's shot in colour is not just a purely aesthetic choice. Everything after that becomes a consideration, from clothing colouring and lighting, which is totally different in that format. Plus things that would ordinarily barely be a consideration, such as should the effects be realistic, maybe up the gore quota, should the film be in stereo, how should 5.1 style sound be implemented, if at all, should the editing be exactly the same, any mistakes should they be kept from the first movie? Speaking of which, by the time the remake came out, there had been three sequels to the original, and a fifth movie was in the works. And a failed pilot became, a, sorry, and it was a failed pilot called Bates Motel, which in turn would be remade, which in turn would be remade itself. So maybe I can't do scripts. Um, and then I was going to break it down shot for shot. Uh, so the so for argument's sake, let's break it down step by step and see why it's so terrible. If that's the case, and the original, and the original is a classic, which of course it is, and then it, oh, that was one thing as well, because I said this is coming off the VHS. <laughs> but one thing I, I've got quite on my notes here. One thing I did think was funny is that uh, probably completely by accident, but obviously this, this 1998 version was kind of, I guess, aimed at people who haven't seen it, so you know they wouldn't know the twist or they wouldn't know sort of what was going to happen in it but there was um, on this VHS there's a trailer for the Alfred Hitchcock collection and they show clips from all these different like Tom Curtin and stuff like that and Rope and all these different ones uh, but then they show a few clips from Psycho and, like literally giving away like all the plot like you know the, the fact that you know he dresses his mother they spin like the mother around and stuff and now it's like spoilers you know and I think that, that again it's one of those things where Again, it's a meta thing. It's you know something that completely flukely is on this VHS. But again, I, I kind of like that. That was um, you know, and then just the, the shot of the clouds behind the Bates Motel. Again, that's some kind of weird composite, you know, CG uh, shot kind of thing. But again, I think it just is. It's their own thing. I mean, again, I love how people. I, I kind of not envious. That's the wrong word. But I kind of love how somebody could look at that shot and go, "Yeah, it's the same." Like. As if, as if they literally just sort of cut and pasted the shot from the original movie, and sort of literally no design work, no skill, no effort, no passion went into that shot. I kind of love how people just 
take all that stuff stuff for granted. And what's kind of cool as well, like things like the the shot of Vince Vaughn reflected there in the in the mirror behind in, in the window behind him as he's holding the tray. Um, and that's one of the first things we did in film studies was like. Um, uh, so you know people dressed and and like you know sort of things like a shadow or reflection normally indicates two personalities and I kind of love how like you know that's obviously again a design choice that was kept from the original they could have easily filmed that so he wasn't reflecting in there or slightly changed the camera angle a little bit but no they kept it in and again I think it's one of these things where why did they do that why sort of you know why did they think yeah let's keep that but not keep something else from the original and i think that's something that like is fascinating i i i'm genuinely surprised that like yeah fair enough you average joe blogs in the streets uh which is a on the making of i don't know if um i don't know if it was scripted or they literally these are the only two people they found but there's a guy on the making of where these sort of people have you seen the original Psycho and you know, Alfred Hitchcock and there's one guy in the making of always makes me laugh when somebody says um, oh what do you think of Alfred Hitchcock and this guy goes oh I don't know Hitchcock what you say <laughs> and really by right I should kind of hate that guy but I always find it dead and do and he's just like oh <laughs> like, uh, yeah but you you have with Joe Bloggs on the street yeah if you say a more or less shop shop remake of Psycho they're going to be like well what is the point uh, but I'm really surprised when quote unquote film fans don't get a kick out of this movie because like I was saying earlier on well if this film didn't exist it doesn't affect the original in any way it's not like that money would have been used for anything good you know it's not like you know like I said they're going to build like you know I don't know what with it, you know, like an animal shelter or something. Uh, but so, yeah, just as a film fan, just to watch this and sort of go, why is this like this? this what well, has that been the original? What this bit? And, and the thing is, though, what I think is amazing is the fact that uh, I have done it in the past, say, I'd either picture in picture or I'd say the video playing and then the DVD playing and, and switch back and forth between the two. And it's really fascinating because you do kind of think it's literally identical you think every shot like every position where somebody's standing or every camera angle is exactly the same every piece of editing is exactly the same and that is true to a point but that said it is amazing the little tiny subtle differences of um just checking the story code uh the um the little tiny subtle differences of where where somebody's sitting or like how she's holding that sandwich might be a little tiny bit different or uh, you know, and like uh, and like Texas was 1998, so it was in um, in the times of like say internet, mobile phones, and things like that. Uh, but I do kind of like the fact though that like you know nobody whips out a mobile phone or when Arbogast later on sort of says he thinks he's got a lead, he's still using a payphone. You know, and I, I, and I kind of like that though. The, the kind of again, you know, stylistically, Arbogast could have easily just been standing where a payphone should have been, but whipped out a mobile phone. But again. No, the, the the you know they decided not to sort of do that or like even now like what well, you know you know even say the mid seventies eighties there was things like CCTV and you know but like as we get closer to say the the two thousands and things like that you know that there's still like you know when he cleans up after the murder you know there's DNA evidence a like DNA evidence and you know they probably would be found like that nowadays and you know the fact that say you know in the mid nineties. You know that policeman when he pulls her over, when he he finds her sleeping, and says you should should have stayed in the motel, which is pretty funny. Um, you know he probably could have checked on the computer and realised that you know who she was and where she would come from and all this kind of stuff. So, but again, they chose not to sort of reference that or just put a little line or nod in the in the updated screenplay there. I, I feel like they changed it just enough, you know, just sort of to. So it felt like a 90s film. But like when I watch this now, I almost get the vibe that it's, it, it wasn't like set... It's kind of, again, sort of, you know, it's like the shop for shop, but not shop for shop thing. So but having me kicking it in it, it kind of... I do feel like the... Uh, you know, I think, yeah, it is modern. But then you you kind of look at this thing, yeah, it is 90s. And then you look at like what they're wearing, thinking, well, what decade is this meant to be set in? And again, it's just that extra stylistic choice that sort of it completely makes it this weird art it's like it, it's such its own thing that it almost does feel like a play uh, you know and again like you know like say if somebody chose to remake a famous play on stage there won't be people 
we saying, oh, look at these pranks we make in Shakespeare or, you know, uh, Dickens or something. But like I say, remaking a screenplay or something, and it's like, well, we can't do that. And it's it's very interesting that, you know, because really there's no difference. And I know it's not like it was never just a play and it was never a sort of film and lost, so they've had to recreate it all. I did hear a rumour, me say, I did hear a rumour recently that it was literally just filmed so Universal could retain the rights, which I don't make it make more sense, but, but to me that's like secondary because... I think that was the reason the Night of the Living Dead remake was remade. And, you know, that doesn't bother me either way, because it's like one of the things where, again, but there's something like with the Night of the Living Dead remake, it, it was so close to the original, if you've seen the original. But I kind of loved how that just tinkered with it just enough, so you were like, oh, I know it's going to happen here, and then, oh, no, it didn't. And it's a bit like, this is obviously a little bit more locked in. But I do kind of like with this that I do think, yeah, I know what's going to happen because this is, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, the original, uh, you know, same screenplay and everything. But at the same time, it just, there's just, uh, there's one part bit where Arbogas comes in and says, do you know what? You can't be fooled, not even by a woman. And there's one little tiny bit of acting where Vince Vaughn looks up and he goes, ah, nah, like, you know, kind of thing. Um, but uh, Anthony Perkins doesn't do that in the original. And so it's these little, little sort of differences that it just keep me coming back to this film over and over again. And I've probably watched this the same amount of times as I've watched the original, and I both get the same levels of enjoyment out of either of them, because A, it's um, sticking up for a film that gets slagged off a lot, and this version, obviously, and then you're just watching the original, you're watching like an absolute stone-cold classic, but, you know, the emotions are the same, the story's the same. Excuse me, um... You know the sort of the concepts are the same, so it's like I say I feel like it would have been more offensive to sort of remake this, but I don't know, not have a steal the money or uh, like um, you know if if she hadn't got murdered in the shower or something like that. I feel like that would have been more. Even if it have offended me, I feel like that that would have been sort of the people would have said, oh, "Why are they changing this? Why are they changing the story? The story was good to start off with." So it's kind of like well. You know, to, to, I feel like they did the right thing to sort of keep it as similar as they did. And, they, and that was another thing as well, that, uh, thinking about it the other day, that in the original she she, she steals 40000 and in this one it's 400000 And again, it's such a... If you don't consciously think about it, it's such a... Oh, it's more money. You know, and it would be more money because it's set, you know, years after the fact, you know, like 30-odd years like, uh, you know, after the fact. But it's like, well... A bit like, say, with Captain America in the Marvel movies, that the longer they keep, um, like, say, if they make a Captain America movie 10 years from now, the gap between World War Two when he gets frozen, and now will be longer. So, say, like, say, 10, 20, 30 years, the, that gap is going to be longer, so it's going to be, it's going to be such a more cultural difference, such a sort of bigger impact from when Captain America thought it was going, oh, wow, we've got hoverboards, whatever. But it's like with this, well, this this film be even even if they wanted to remake it in the future, will it be you know will she be like having a million pound in cash and it, it'd be like oh yeah or you know like you know three quarters of a million uh, you know that like you know will that even be conceivable that you know that somebody would take that much and even in this uh, do people take four hundred thousand pounds to the bank in cash would that e- is that even realistic is that like almost a, a fantasy element of this film now that like would somebody again and this is that thing where. Uh, like I know you can over, and like it's ridiculous in the in the commentary, but you can I know you can overanalyze stuff too much and deconstruct things, and you can almost ruin a film by sort of getting oh like it's like how many times people have watched Star Wars now or you know some classic movie and got oh that's stupid that's stupid that's stupid that's stupid that's stupid and, you know that's why you know things like you know these parodies of Star Wars work so well because you know Ben Kenobi changed his name from Obi Wan Kenobi to Ben Kenobi. When he heard and you know and Luke becoming you know it, you know into this Jedi religion slagging off Han you know you know saying you know, we don't believe in Jedi's and he's like he didn't believe in Jedi's either and as much as I love Star Wars that you can deconstruct it to think oh that's ridiculous that's ridiculous that's ridiculous but it still works as a great movie but it's like with this film now as the years progress and like say things like inflation money is 
it, it, money is worth more or less, depending on you know, you know, like I said, and like say all these things like say DNA, CCTV. Does this film become more believable or more stupid? Like say, I, I literally never really thought about it until I've just said it, but the fact that like say four hundred thousand. Do, like, would that just be something? Even in 1998, would that just be something? An inconceivable thing to take four hundred thousand dollars in cash to the bank? I mean, I'm normally got um, if I've got twenty pound in my wallet, I feel like a billionaire. So you know, to me, I'm, I, I can't almost you know imagine that amount of money. But that's an interesting that thing. You know, that I always remember this in this at college when this uh, cause I, I went the film studies one year after this film came out. I always remember uh, this was like. Oh, you see, masturbating, and you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, but again, that's an, an, an element where uh, it's such a sort of, you know, again, just putting that in there. Did they just put in there just to really rub people up? No, no, uh, no offense, no pun intended. Um, did they put that in there to just literally sort of, you know, mess with people's minds? Going, this will just really annoy so many people, or was it like? Yeah, that's probably what he would have been doing. I mean, and again, it always kind of makes me laugh. It's a bit like with this, um, uh, these like it's so and hostile films. I love how you get real hardcore, tie dyed, you know, you know, set in stone horror movie fans that don't get offended by anything. You can see people having sex, people taking drugs, people being set on fire, people having their heads cut off. And when these films like Saw and Human Centipede and all these kind of, oh, it's torture porn, oh, it's really horrible, oh, and they're like, oh, and you're the people that like Friday the 13th and all this kind of stuff. And I kind of love how people can watch the original Psycho, or, you know, Psychos 1 and 2 and stuff. And See people being stabbed to death in the shower, and people being killed, whacked on the head with shovel, and the concept of somebody digging up his dead mother and keeping her in the fruit salad and stuff. And then you can watch all that stuff and go, "Oh no, that's brilliant! It's the best film I've ever seen." And oh, and Hitchcock, genius, or and all this kind of thing. And then watch this fishing. Oh, he's masturbating. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> I just kind of, and I'm a hypocrite because, like, say, I mean, I know I can be contradictory and probably even done it on this very commentary. Uh, and I know I can turn on a dime of things I like and don't like. So, uh, but it, it does always kind of just just raise a little flag up sometimes when I hear people talk about because I think, well, is it genuinely somebody's opinion? Is it just genuinely what they think? And like I must have said it on a million commentaries, but like you know, when it comes to art, I mean, I know you know in a lot of ways to a lot of other people, there's a lot more important things in the world. But I'm really passionate about music and movies and and video games and things like that. And if somebody genuinely does or doesn't like something, if it's their opinion and they say, oh, my favourite video game is, I don't know, you know, a game I've never heard of, or my favourite music artist is Johnny Cash, or somebody really respectable, or, you know, and then, it, but if that's genuinely their opinion, then that's fine. But, like, uh, yeah, no, when people slag this film off, are they just saying it to say, oh, the Psycho remake, oh, uh, you know, again, like say, if you know, if somebody, if I, I I've yet, uh, excuse me, say, I've not been drinking, by the way, uh, I yet to have seen somebody. Speaking of which, I've got some water here. Let's have a quick sip. This is still, I mean, even now, remake or otherwise, you know, this is still one of those sequences where you just kind of think, oh, you know. It's not going to happen. <laughs> it's kind of like you know you see that door open in the background and she's got she's a goner, <laughs> you know. And again, though, it's still it's like again this um, this concept got ripped off um, by um, a scream when Drew Barrymore gets killed at the start. You know, you think this is the person I'm going to be following for the whole film, and boom, gone. And it's still is it interesting. It doesn't really happen that often in films, you know, when a character you expect be in it till the end gets killed. Uh, I feel like that that is still a, a jarring. Uh, that's that, and again, I like how they sh- put um, shots of clouds in there, and again, potentially as hell, uh, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, they put clouds in there, so what? But just like you know, when it's it, when I, I know I'm saying it time and time again, boring myself with it. But when people say it's shot for shot, and it isn't, I mean. And I kind of love that, though, that they've literally sort of took so much from the original, so many stylistic choices, so many camera positions, so many uh, elements of different things, but at the same time, just putting these little extra two-second shots in there, it makes it not shot for shot, 
But at the same time, every interview they ever did was, oh, yeah, it's shot, shot. And uh, allegedly, you could see a bottle there if you really look. Fact fans. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, and even something as simple as this, that, like, this is, like, such a meta thing. Every film fan thinks he's so clever because, you know, in the original, they used chocolate syrup. And obviously, because it was black and white film, it didn't show up as, as brown, which is disgusting. But, like, uh, again, a horror film fan, right? Chocolate syrup, you know, it'll be disgusting. Uh, but yeah, that uh, that like everybody thinks that oh like, oh it was chocolate syrup in the original, but because of that it's red and it's and it, you know it's like I, I'm sure with little things like that that they can't pull their own facts out like oh that's chocolate syrup in the original, it's like, obviously fake blood. This is interesting because um, in the original I can never remember if the camera rotates or not, and I think it does. I can't remember if the, that might be an interesting thing to check if the camera rotates there, but then and even that, like that's you know done in the original, but done in this one again where, you know, you know, imagine just having your face like that on the floor for like I, I know it's like you know first world problems, right? Like uh, uh, you know, but like wow, God, I don't know if I could just stare into space like that for that long without blinking. And even now, I mean, like you know, when you've seen the original, seen this one, you think, wow, there's all that money in there. And it just gets blown away. That's a great shot. And again, I think, like, say, um, this shot, when he's talking to Mother, uh, and doing air quotes there, when he's talking to Mother, I think uh, I think there's parts of it that's Vince Vaughn's voice, parts of it's the original Mother voice from the original cycle, and I think there's um, a third actress, oh, oh, sorry, a third actor in there. Um, but I, I, again, no, I, I really do, and this is uh, something, like I said, I don't really want to repeat the making of that much, because... Um, Anybody who's a fan of this film and you've probably seen the making of a million times, but um, yeah, that like from this point on, the colours completely change. That they get more intense, more you know, more sort of more vivid and and things like that. So uh, again, I, I think people, say, oh yeah, you know, it's just the original. But there's so much of this that is is their own their own design and things. It's really fascinating as well, though, because, like, say, I mean, when you think they, they like, literally, Anthony Perkins was probably standing by the that exact same post thirty years previous to this, you know, thirty forty years previous, but then you can fast forward that far in the future, and it, it's so, it's just like, say, I mean, I know I'm going on about it time to, I, no, no, I mean, that's such one of those things where. Like, I know I laugh at my sense of humour sometimes is so silly, and I just love the science that's newly renovated on that side. I mean, you know, it's just, again, such a small element, completely pointless, completely useless, really, but I can't stop thinking that's that's a nice little gag. I mean, I don't know how many people noticed that. Um, I don't know if I noticed it the first time around, to be honest. But again, though, it's fascinating that when I said that this this film is very rarely on TV, I mean, I'm really struggling to think, even say with extra channels like Sky Movies and things like that. That I can't remember the last time I saw this. I don't even know if it's on Blu-ray. I don't know if it's on sort of YouTube to sort of watch, or I don't think it's on Netflix. I, I typed Psycho in on Netflix, and they had Psycho Two and uh, the first series of Bates Motel. So yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of fascinating, really. Yeah, the uh, if you look at that show, it matches the buttons on the dress, which again, you know. I mean, I've got an LG TV at the moment in, but the previous LG TV I had, you could do picture in picture or side by side. And it was really funny, though, sometimes, though, just to get both versions up simultaneously or just compare shots on the internet and it's like I say I do find it fascinating that you think oh even like you know because I feel like I've seen both these films lots of times and you kind of think yeah I, I know the original really well and I know the remake really well and then you think oh that's different oh that's nothing as well I only found this out relatively recently with those mixer taps like if you're not from the UK we just have one tap for hot one tap for cold and you either you know you're either burning your hands or you're either freezing you know the hollow to yourself but that's one great system the American taps have how it's like uh, you can mix the two so you can get like uh, you know if you're one of these fancy people that can have your hot water you can't afford electrical bills <laughs> 
I mean, even this, Josie Stefano says, um, and that was nothing that was well, uh, it's it, not far from me. I noticed the hairdresser's uh, Joseph Di Stefano, so uh, I'll have to uh, take a photograph and put it up with the, um, I'll try to do a text element part to it as well, for on the website. Uh, be interesting to just see if it is that same one. Oh yeah, but if Josie Stefano said, um, that this scene should be long, the cleaning up sequence, and that's one thing. Obviously, if they did it in every horror film, especially like Friday the Thirteenth, it barely makes sense. But I, I think that's one thing that you know people watch things like this and think, oh yeah, you could just dispose your body in five seconds. But you know, I assume it would take quite a bit. But yeah, I'll just see if uh, I'm just on Sarban's side. Oh, one person has done the um, Psycho 1998. It's interesting. I don't think nobody had. It could be interesting to download that. Uh, yeah, just see if we... As if it isn't on sort of YouTube to stream. Because I know like nowadays you can... Uh, you can stream things. It's like, where where can you get this movie from nowadays? Oh yeah, it's there. Yeah, you can um, stream it for 249 It's not bad. Uh, oh, so you can't go now. <laughs> be interesting, I'll show you it. Um, I can check on car movie database, see if it would be so funny if all, all these cars were um, uh, really old. Which was kind of like the, the um, not updating it kind of thing. But again, I'm sure they must have done stuff like this on purpose where. Like you say, you know, you're like literally just a couple of years off the year 2000, and you think some of the futuristic things they could have had in this, like, like say, somebody using the internet or somebody, um, uh, uh, somebody sort of driving a really cool looking modern car with loads of chrome on it or something like that. And they're like, no, I just keep everything that old fashioned. Is it? Uh, oh, yeah, it's on. Um, in the car movie database, 94, what was that, a Volvo, that was a, ni oh, that was a 1984 Volvo, I thought it looked old, a lot of the cars um, are from the 90s, there's a 50s car there, that, what's, what's something that's interesting though as well, um, it's one of these shots on car movie databases is a, is a shot from the credits, and that's another thing though, like again, I mean, sometimes I don't think I'm that geeky, and then other times it's like, wow, this is so geeky, but like, um, this film's got credits, and it's really cool that like, uh, and the and the original hasn't. So that's like at least two or three minutes of this film don't exist at all in the original version. But it's kind of cool to see the credits going up. And then if you watch the making of, even Gus Van Sant said he was part of like a, a comedy troupe, and they did a version of the shower scene from Psycho. So again. It's this extra level of matter on there that, like, you know, even if it literally had just been shot for shot, um, you know, wearing the same clothes and everything, that would have been enough, it seems like, just really annoy people or fascinate people. But I just love how it's layer after layer after layer of, um, you know, such subtle things and such things that you can only know from researching it or figuring it out yourself. Uh, but I feel like that it's kind of almost like a, like a prize almost. And something, one thing I do like about movies, they say, compared to say something like I've never really big been a big fan of TV shows where you've got what 500 episodes or something and if you miss one episode it makes no sense whatsoever but one thing I do quite like about films where I've got quite an addictive personality and even though I you know like this week I brought the new Equalizer and I've watched that and I've brought um, uh, you know you know recent more recent films you know and I still watch a lot of modern movies and, and new films that I've got a bad habit of watching like say something like this, I've watched it so many times, easily must be 30, 40 times, conservatively, it's probably more than that, uh, and usually I watch it drunk, it's probably one of the first times since I very first saw it, I've watched it sober, uh, but anyway, that's beside the point, but, they, um, but yeah, they, when you watch a film a lot, and this is one thing, again, why I think things like Family Guy work so well, and and why a lot of meta jokes work so well on the internet, like where you, you'll get films like Die Hard gets mentioned a lot, and say Star Wars or Crawl or Flash Gordon. But any film that a film fan watching so lot, I feel almost like the you, you will just be like, oh, never noticed that before. 
excuse me, and it's such like I think such a sense of, um, and I don't want the right phrases without sounding stupid, but it's like it feels like a sense of pride or achievement that like that you can watch a film thirty times and not notice something, and then go, was that always in there? Was that always there? That little nod or gesture or little inflection in the music or the way just just something catches your eye, you think. How could I have possibly not seen that before? And I, I do think that's kind of cool that, like, you know, people who watch, like, the same soap for 30 years, and it's, like, different episode, different episode, different episode, different episode, but you can watch, like, say, I've seen this film so much now that I almost feel like I could do it line by line. Oh, oh, I've got two versions to go into this. But, yeah, that, like, kind of... And, again, talking about sort of meta, that, like, that uh, Viggo Mortensen's character is named Sam Loomis, John Carpenter gave Donald Pleasance his character the name Sam Loomis. Then it got remade by Rob Zombie and Rob Zombie's in the, the character name is from Psycho. Janet Lee was in it and Janet Lee's daughter was Jamie Lee Curtis and Jamie Lee Curtis was in Halloween and I do kind of love that though that um, I was talking about this stuff that you know don't spot for ages but that uh, the guy behind the counter there is Flea from the Red Hot, Ch- uh, from the Red Hot Chili Peppers and as me being a very amateur bass player Kind of nice to see literally one of the world's best bass players just there. Like, um, but that I can see though why I say that shot there where she takes um, the headphones off. Even I kind of love that, but at the same time, that is so. Uh, but again, it's that thing where to me, I don't mind stuff like that. Okay, that's stupid. It kind of is, really. I mean, but even again, saying about this film sort of taking on um, an extra quality now that an element they put in this that at the time was probably like oh let's make her cool man so she she works in a record store uh, uh, she works in a record store in this but now saying you work in a record record store you may as well say you work in antiques or something or you're not even antiques because that's a believable trade you know like now if I said to somebody you know I work uh, oh I'm going to try to find a record shop I may as well be trying to find, you know, a taxidermy shop, no pun intended. Well, it was actually. But, uh, uh, you, know, that, uh, you know, it's like so ridiculous now, you know, like say. So I'd, I'd kind of like, you know, if anybody under uh, 40 is listening to this commentary, I'd kind of always like to, just to, to see what people say that aren't as stuck in the ways as me there. I still think of there being loads of record shops and video shops and the green grocers and things like this. But do people watch it? Watch even like this scene and think, this is just a hardware store. I can't remember the last time I went in an independent hardware store. I mean, I've got memories of that. And, and sort of sometimes when I go visit my dad, he lives in a little village and there's these little independent shops that have been there for years. But that said, I watch something like this and they smile. this may as well be from the 40s, not like the 90s. You think when this film came out, there was internet and all this kind of cool stuff, like one year away from the Phantom Menace, you've got, you know, films with complete CG characters in them and stuff like that. And then you've got like, what's their cultural advancement? Like, put some headphones on it, you know, but... Uh, and what two good-looking people there? Well, will you make Macy too? But again, no, again, talking about this, like, how uh, it's just in-built, in-built, like, uh, everything's all... Uh, I'm, I'm a sucker of it anybody who's connected to if somebody did this and that person knew this person and I'm a real like it just it just punches all my buttons I love all that stuff but like Vigo Mortensen if you think then most people know he's this like really respected you know deservedly so this really respected actor and like what you know one of the first films I could ever remember even being aware of him was like Leatherface Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 and I kind of love that though that like Again, you've got this like horror remake, sequel sort of vibe. You know, everything's just all just so in there, so layered, so sort of. You know, if you're a film like again, I I just don't see how sort of film fans could not get a kick out of that. Good, oh, that's that guy from that thing. This is interesting as well. That like uh, sometimes when you see Vince Vaughn, I kind of like that. It, it's a just like what kind of great sort of he's posturing sort of you know you see when he's aggressive when he he whacks him sound with a golf club 
and you know it's kind of like uh, that, that's what I find really scary to me that like say a film like this I think where it works is um, like say if you see as much as I love say Freddy, Jason, Michael Myers all those kind of people there, there is something like uh, to me what's more scary is the way and you see say when sometimes you're walking down into your local town centre or you're waiting for a bus or something and the way people can change sometimes on a dime like you know like that sort of go from being like you know just throwing a nice polite conversation to you know, if they see something, they're annoying or something, and they, and they completely explode. And, and that's what's scary is like the way when, like, say, you think in this house, sort of, he's this really friendly, nice guy, and at the same time, he's this killer. And I guess that's, again, where obviously it's from the original, and it's from, you know, but again, you know, talk about that, that's one thing I meant to say is that the original novel, which I've got literally next to me, but I haven't, it's what's funny though, because this is nothing, there are those people, it's the novel with the, the cover from the side, it, so it's the original novel, but with the cover from, uh, also with the poster from uh, uh, Psycho, so it's like, uh, it's just Psycho 1998, but people hate that, and that's one thing, it just makes me like it even more, but yeah, I haven't read the novel, but apparently it's quite different, so again, but people love the original, but the fact that they changed the novel, it's like, oh yeah, screw Robert Block, uh, you know, and I kind of love how people are like that, that like, uh, again, it's that thing of, Oh, that's fine. But, like, remaking it again is, oh, that's, like, a crime against cinema. But, um, this was another thing I've got. I've got the Psycho Blu-ray. And I think this is worthy of mention, is that the Psycho 1998 poster's really clever. Again, putting the most stamp on it, really clever, really creative. Probably better than any of you know, the posters for the original Psycho. Um, uh, although the Psycho 3 poster's something else it does have to be said. And the Psycho 2 poster, for that matter. But that's cool. And then, like I say, the, um, the box, uh, the, the boot cover is really good as well. But what's really good about this film though as well, and I think this is probably why I enjoy this film as well, is just the story is so good. Because it's one of them films where... Even if you've seen it, and even if you've seen, you know, you know, you know, everybody knows the twist and things like that. I do kind of love the fact, though, that like it's that thing where you think, well, like when he when when he goes outside and the men and they're saying, oh, is that woman at the window? Oh, there's nobody there. And it's like, what? I can see. Oh, it's my set mother and all this, but you know that that she's not really alive. And then you know that he's sort of faking it and he's putting all this stuff on and stuff like that. So, uh, this is a great bit of as a nice. But again, I, I think, like, there, like, there, there's that little frown he's doing and things. And again, you know, Anthony Perkins, wow, what an incredible actor. I mean, you know, you just, you know, you see him in anything and he's good, you know, Black Hole and, you know, kind of, you know, similar, but he's just an incredible actor, you know, stuff like that. But Vince Vaughn, obviously, he's got this reputation for being, like, in comedy and things like that. But just really, as a real extra. Alan, and like for years and years, I, I sort of, uh, I didn't sort of, uh, you know, it took me a while to warm to this, to Vince Vaughn in this part, but I think like, he is good, and you know, I, I think it's a, sh a shame really that like, I must have said this before in other commentaries, but I always used to think it was funny that like, when I was growing up, if I ever used to watch a remake of something, uh, I know this is an extreme example of Shop Shop, but I've, if you watch a remake or something, always used to make my laugh that older people always should say, oh, it's not got the proper people in it. And I think, it, I do think it's amazing though that like, and this made me think about movies in such a completely different way, that you can get a film like this, that you can have all this great stuff, like, you know, literally, you know, from the foundations upwards of, you know, everything about this film is brilliant. And somebody could watch this game. Yeah, that's not around Anthony Perkins, yeah, stuff, stuff the film. I, I, it's so, uh, like, say, 17 years later, and probably, you know, 20 years from now, if I'm still alive, I'll still be saying the exact same things that, like, it's really, it's just fascinating to me. And it, I, I do, I do, you know, I guess that thing about, like, all that laugh laughs kind of crazy. <laughs> well, I guess he was a psycho, right? But um, I do find it, uh, like, and a new line for you. Uh, but again, it's that thing where if I hadn't have seen the making of and I hadn't have, you know, seen the original so many times, seen this so many times, that line would have just completely passed me by and gone, 
That was the same line. But I wonder how many people could watch the scene and know that that change was even in there. Uh, you know, the people go, oh, shut up, shut up, the same. But it's not. Uh, you know, I know I've said it a hundred times already, but... And even that, nothing to do with Psycho. But I've since come to realise that the phrase, no thanks, might be one of the funniest things anybody can ever say. There's just something about somebody saying, do you want to do this? Slight pause. No, no thanks. <laughs> I don't know why, no. If I ever, ever hear anybody say no thanks, it just kind of is like, what? Because <laughs> it's like polite and super sarcastic. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh no, there is you. I like that. I mean, I've done it myself enough times on this commentary board. I think that's really interesting as um, an actor. Like I heard, um, not as me as an actor, but as people who can act. I mean, I'm one of the worst actors that's ever lived. Anybody who's uh, watched my YouTube channel, but uh, that, that little that little pause is so brilliant. I mean, that just endears me so much to Vince Ford as um, Norman Bates. Just that micro acting, but just creates so much backstory and pathos in it. It's so cool. But yeah, I heard. Um, a voice actor saying, uh, who plays Obi Wan in some of the new Star Wars cartoons, saying that uh, when you see like Hugh McGregor as Obi Wan, is Hugh McGregor as Obi Wan as Alec Guinness doing Obi Wan, and he was saying he was him um, as Alec Guinness as as Hugh McGregor as Alec Guinness as Obi Wan, and I do kind of like that, like there where he was stumble over stumbling over his words that like you've got to act like you don't know what you're going to say next and you're struggling to think of the words, but you're acting that you. Because it's obviously all written down, so you, and it's not like some, you know, it's not like a spinal tap thing where, or Kirby enthusiasm where it's all improvised and you can add lip with something like this because it is the same screenplay and everything. And obviously, Anthony Perkins had the same problem in the original. That like, I'd love to know what the thinking of is as um, an actor there, there that you've got to sort of pretend to be flustered. And I, uh, and I always think it's interesting about acting. I don't mean there's no disrespect, but like um, one of my favourite martial arts films is called The Perfect Weapon. And the guy in it is Jeff Speakman. And he said before, Andy, he did six months of acting lessons. But he's really good in that. And you never think that he, you know, that he had been acting for like 10 years or something. Uh, and I, I kind of love like this thought about acting now. It's like, I guess it ties in perfectly with Psycho. Though it's almost, I guess, you're like you're dividing your brain into two separate things. You've got believe something's real, but no, it's fake, and you've got to be in that character in that moment, but know when to sort of just turn it on and off. And uh, you know, kind of really fascinating. I I love a payphone shot, and uh, you know, I'm always a sucker. I see a payphone, I'm like, oh, payphone. Uh, so it's like completely. I know this is probably just. Um, making me sound more of a mad person than I already am, but some of, just any scene with a payphone in kind of makes me happy somehow. That's one thing I think is funny as well, where he says, because uh, uh, I don't know where old uh, Anthony Perkins was in the original, but I've got a feeling he was relatively young, probably about 50, I don't know, but uh, there where he says, this young boy that runs the hotel, and it kind of always makes me laugh. I watched um, a film the other week, a really early Charles Bronson, um, it was a TV show actually come on with the camera and someone in that says to Charles Bronson a young man, a young man Charles Bronson, <laughs> he was like about 137 years old when he made that film and it's like Vince Vaughn in this it's like, you know, so he's saying the young boy that runs the motel and he's like, about, he's like my age I mean the thing as well about this film, it's like watching the, the original but, uh, uh, is it just makes you either want to watch that other, it's like I'm watching the original sometimes thinking but did that happen in the 98 one? And that, now just seeing that long shot of like uh, the motel uh, cabins, it makes me just want, you know, even though it's, I've literally got the Blu-ray behind me, it makes me just want to, you know, crack that out like, you know. But again, that was another thing though as well, because like I say, I'm doing this from the VHS, so hopefully this should sync up if um, if you if you try and sync up this commentary from YouTube or a Blu-ray or any kind of HD source, because VHS, PAL VHS, I think, runs at the same frame rate as a lot of um, a lot of different things. But the Blu-ray to the original Psycho, it is so good. It is so clear. I mean, I don't know why the opening Paramount logo always looks really rough on Psycho, no matter what version you want to to the cinema. It just looks bizarre for some reason. I don't know why, but, um, uh, but the actual Blu-ray of Psycho, the original, is immaculate. And... 
I do think it's funny that, like, again, just always this thing that endears me to these films is the something as simple as that. Like, I've got quite a few Blu-rays from all different eras, eras and different time periods. Like, I got the Cabinet to Dr. Caligari uh, Blu-ray from your know, first horror film, film from the 20s, or one of the first horror films. Uh, and, you know, that's pretty good, but obviously it was, that would be restored from all these different elements and everything. So, brilliant uh, Blu-ray DVD to pick up, by the way. Perfect, she's got a booklet in there telling you how to set up your TV when you're watching it and telling you where all the different elements have come from. It's got reviews from the 1920s, it's got making arms and everything for the uh, Eureka DVD. Um, yeah, it uh, comes to Dr. Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, get there if you can. But yeah, they, it's like literally one of the clearest DVDs I've got is Psycho, and it's like a film from the 60s made with a TV crew, low budget, and it's perfect. And again, though. Even though there's only a couple of kills in this film, you know, which is nothing by you know modern horror movie standards, but again, you almost like thinking, well, you know, I'd love to know if this still because even though I know it's going to happen now, the fact that like you know, it's kind of like you're thinking, well, I don't know, it almost doesn't look like he's, he, uh, you know, it's obviously he's walking in the dark, spooky house, he's probably not going around well, right? But at the same time, it's kind of like. Do you reckon he's going to just get killed right here? Here we go. Again, though, those little shots there of like that woman with the blindfold on and like the cow and stuff. Again, I, I, uh, I don't think I've ever heard exactly why they picked those shots, but like, like oh, what's that? Oh, Judy Garland. I know. Never again. Talk about. I've. Did you ever find? Vigo Munson, attractive, no Julia Moore. <laughs> uh, I never noticed looking at Julie Garland album before, but that's so great, that, like I was saying before, that like, um, I'm that jar of beer. It's like, uh, like hillbillies. Uh, but, uh, oh wow, and there's a picture of like, uh, is it Joseph there? Oh wow, that's interesting. I've never noticed those three things before. Probably too, too busy looking at her boobs. <laughs> What is interesting they're talking about, say, like, though, um, mobile phones, because I'm sure a lot of people, and I think even I had a mobile phone in 1998, 19, I don't know, I'm trying to think. Anyway, but it is, I wonder if that was um, a deliberate thing that nobody uses a mobile phone in this, that um, anybody uses, uh, everybody uses landline phones or pay phones. That's an, uh, so what's interesting about it as well, like, and we had, um, so my texting took off really quick in Europe and the UK, and I don't remember seeing anybody mention texting in America for quite a bit. I remember seeing mobile phones, even in things like, say, Text Exchange or Massacre 2, and the film before the one he was in there. Uh, I remember seeing a mobile phone in that, so, you know, I know mobile phones were knocking around you know, in America at the same time as they were here, I guess it would be. Uh, so, yeah, that's a very interesting stylistic choice there. You know, I've never heard anybody mention that on the making of or anything like that, why they chose not to. One thing as well, I think I found it out from uh, Zarbon's website, that um, the original is actually, and again, this is like a meta thing that everybody loves nowadays. I read somebody say this the other day, and I thought this was a great observation. Let's say years ago, if you asked somebody what the favourite Christmas film was, it would always be you know, White Christmas, Santa Claus movie, blah, blah, blah. But like now, most film fans, or a lot of guys especially, track cool or hard, or say like, oh, Die Hard, or Gremlins, or something like that. But like I say, the original Psycho was a Christmas movie. And even though on this, you'll see people write the date down, it's like December 1998. And I don't actually think you see any Christmas decorations in this film. So that's an interesting thing again they knew it was set in December they probably knew excuse me, uh, that the original was a Christmas movie but chose not to is this the only Hollywood film set in December where nobody mentions Christmas you don't see a Christmas tree, you don't see a Christmas card again it's this thing, there's such a great thing where the most derivative film that's probably ever been made and at the same time original as anything um 
the director there playing the sheriff, uh, he says something cool in the making of where he says, um, people watching this film, are they literally making quick mental comparisons back and forth between this and the original? And I think that's what's something about this film where even say a lot of sequels or a lot of remakes obviously you can't help but if it's a sequel or you know especially sequel but you can't help but think oh did this happen in the original or would this character do that kind of thing but with this being what it is it is so fascinating for it just to literally is this another thing maybe why people don't like this film where you almost can't change your brain off when you watch it you can just watch this or watch the original and not think of this version, or not think of the original version. So maybe that's a thing where you know people like a lot of people watch films just to turn off or relax, or whatever. But if you are constantly going, oh, what's this? What's this? What's this? What's this? What's this? What's this? You know, it kind of it could be something that I could I could imagine some people would find annoying. So that kind of is interesting. I feel like Arbogast though. That's a name that I see in other places apart from um, the Psycho movies. And I've just wondered, I've heard that name Arbogast before. I mean, even that. I mean, like I said earlier on, but I kind of love that though, that like, even though I've seen this film so many times, and you know, sometimes when you've seen a film so much that, the, you know, any kind of joke or in reference, just you think, oh yeah. But the, even now we've got so far in this film, you, you know, good like, you know, you know, hour and fifteen minutes into the film, and people are still talking about Norman Bates's mother. Like, and, but as far as like half of the cast are concerned, that she's still a character that's alive and exists, and sort of, you know, could I have some sort of affect the plot in a certain way? And like, she's just not there anymore. She doesn't exist. <laughs> it's pretty funny. That's one thing as well that I kind of love as well. That like um, uh, that you do, you don't really care it anymore, but you get like say a lot of like my older relatives or so you get people of certain age that when they were embarrassed by something they would whisper it. So when she said in bed, like I kind of like that again. But it's like one of these films where again it's a remake, but because it was set in the nineties, and even though really. Even though they took it on, the, I was going to say really silly, but not really. But even though they chose to diminish the effects of it being set in the nineties by almost, you know, like I say, this could have been filmed in the eighties or the seventies. I don't think it really would have made that much difference. But I, I, like, you know, it is set in the nineties. I think people still act acted and spoke like that then. So it's really fascinating to sort of uh, just think, you know, seventeen years ago. Uh, there was, say, um, a lot more, say, older people knocking around, or there was a lot of, say, like, even now when I, say, see an advert for Mother's Day or Father's Day, and if it's, uh, get a PlayStation 4 for Father's Day with uh, FIFA 15, I'm like, well, why would a dad like that? And then I forget, oh, yeah, there's dads in the, you know, 20s or whatever that are into video games and stuff. And so, sort of seeing older characters in movies and just certain turns of phrase there, Either don't get used as much, or just certain ways of speaking. Even with me, I found myself either saying really old-fashioned things and catch myself off guard by saying, "Oh, I can't believe I've said the word nuke, nukes and crannies or something." And I'm like, yeah, well, "How am I saying that?" <laughs> like, you know, or, or something like that, or just, or just, you know, or then to say, even say, some of my younger relatives, or say, if you just see some young kids in the street saying something, and you're like, "Wow, I would never say that. I would, or I would never think like that." You know, so I do find it interesting that like. Um, a bit like Romero said with the the dead films that he wanted to try and make one every 10 years. Look, I mean, look at that great rear screen projection there. Look, I mean, when you really overanalyze anything, that looks, you know, but that's a bit, that looks great. I mean, I never want one of these old people that watches old films and go, oh, they're dead realistic in my day, but like that, that looks, oh, that's a great shot. Look at that. You wouldn't think that was just a wooden frame of a house there. That looks so good. I still don't know quite how they do that because. The Bates, the original Bates house, as far as I can gather, was just like a wooden frame. But they seem to have shots of him like walking in and out of it, like it, like it looks like it's on the set. It doesn't look like it's like a set somewhere else. Uh, yeah, but like so, yeah. And Romero was saying that um, yeah, every ten years he wanted to make like a zombie film and sort of 
you know, sort of touch on what was happening in that decade and how people think and how effects were made and, you know, just it'd be more fr- it, the same story but from that time period and I feel like it's probably never happened again in my lifetime anyway but if somebody does decide to do another shot shot remake of this film it'd be fascinating to sort of see will that shot with Arbogast on the payphone beach the guy mobile will there be internet in it will um, you know will the people playing the sheriff and his wife be just a 20 year old who just look and talk like everybody else and or you know will the thought of even you know, an independent motel be, you know, something that would it, will this will this film have to be a period piece? You know, like I say, will somebody have the opportunity to run away with a million pound in cash? You know, like thirty, forty years from now. So, uh, like I said, I didn't really think about it until watching this. But again, this is that thing where I feel like that. Um, like I said, I've said it twenty times already, but um, and I feel like that. You know, sometimes watching the same film over and over again can make you think in certain ways. And I think, especially if you're defending something where, yeah, you know, same as everybody else, you're just like, well, this is shit. And that's the thing where it's like, this is one thing I've I never minded if something gets slagged off, but with with a reason. Like I said, somebody said, I don't like this because it is a bit derivative and it just, you know. It just washes over me. I don't. I don't interact with the characters as much as the original, or I feel like I just prefer black and white over color, or just just not just this film. Just generally, if somebody slags off something, but has got some, you know, some reason to slag that film that thing off, uh, then I think yeah, fair enough. It's like with say food. I I never minded if say people don't like peas or sprouts or or say people don't like ale or whiskey or milk or something because you know i'm not a big fan of drinking milk and stuff but i don't particularly like the taste that much and i think like you know if you don't like peas because i don't like peas and that's fine if you don't like peas because it's green then you want to punch in the face and it's a bit like with this it's like yeah if you don't like this film because and you've got two or three reasons if it's oh sort of something you make and then again, like I say, I've said ten times, but I feel like that, you know, like I say, just watching this film again, just watching this film doing the commentary, just watching this film sober, it's it's made all these thoughts and all these things in my head come out with something that I, nah, I've never thought about before. Seventeen years watching this film, I say, watched it at the cinema, watched it on DVD, watched it on video, and until we just getting near the end of this commentary now, I've never thought of could they remake this film again? Could this film be remade this year? And people go, pay phone, <laughs> and laugh. I mean, I've never thought about that until I just said it, uh, you know, uh, or you know, not not really consciously. Anyway, I might have thought, oh, pay phones are getting rare, and you know, even there's a pay phone, you know, ten yards from the house. I don't, I can't remember the last time I used it. I don't know if it works or not. Uh, you know, and, and my dad sometimes phoned me from the pay phone from the club he goes, working men's club. And sometimes, you know, you have to hit it with armor guy working. <laughs> so, you know, like say. You know, just say if this film was being filmed today, could you? Obviously, you could remake it shot for shot, and you could do the same thing again. You could find an old payphone somewhere and just pretend that it worked, or like there, that Chew TV there. You know, you know, it, it just I think the Chew TVs work. You know, depending on what they're connected to. But yeah, could you remake this film now? And I know this at the time, people slagged it off, but because it was a remake of Psycho, but how many how many contemporary horror films? Could be remade, like could you remake Night of Living Dead again? You know, would it be believable that, like, you know, that, like, you know, there'd be, you know, I don't know, an old farmhouse, you know, how many old farmhouses still knock around? Or probably a bad example because it's probably lots, but like, uh, like, say, they're on about um, rebooting Friday the Thirteenth and having it set in the eighties. Does it need to be set in the eighties? Would that concept only work in the eighties? The, you know, things like health and safety, and you know, you know, would that, you know, would it as, you know, be more? Would could would camp counselors now be taking drugs and having sex and all that kind of stuff? Would that be a believable element to that film being remade? And and that's the thing I think with this film that, like I say, I I think that's that's where or I don't want to be really pretentious about it but like say the few times I have been say an art gallery or I have been in a museum or you do watch um, a DVD like a TED lecture or you you watch something that does even though I can watch the stupidest dumbest you know moronic stuff that's ever been you know pressed on vinyl or put on DVD or you know I, I can listen to and watch and read 
some of the dumbest things that have ever, ever been made. But the few times I have tried and sort of expand my knowledge of something, or do try to think about something in some weird, esoteric, nebulous way that, like, it does sort of make me think that, like, well, I'm kind of glad I've got that, you know, even though I am stupid, I'm kind of glad I've got that element to my brain where it, I do try and think about stuff in different ways. I do try and sort of sometimes try and analyse things. And, like, talk about, like, I started film studies. I dropped out, I've, I've got to say, but I, I did um, start studying film about a year after this film came out. And before I went to college, and I went to college, uh, and pulling down my, uh, before I went to college, I thought I knew everything about film. I thought, yeah, I watched loads of films, loads of different genres, loads of different decades of film, loads of different countries of films. Uh, I buy film magazines, and I like know where films get made and stuff like that. I did like you know six months of film studies, completely opened my mind, completely, completely you know sort of real eye opening. You know. I, all different kinds of ways and you know just like wow I never thought about a film like this before I've never thought about a film like that before and again like you say you know just watching this remake over the years that I think it's a shame that people can't get that level of enjoyment out of this film that like say you know I, I probably two weeks from now I'll probably watch this film again and go oh yeah I remember when I thought about that thing on the commentary and oh and it'd be really fascinating again I'm not just saying it you know just to you know draft up the comment section or anything but like Excuse me, like on YouTube, if um, anybody wants to leave comments below and just say, Excuse me, I'm going to say, Excuse me. Um, that's, it was the water in your boobs so much. Uh, but yeah, that like, um, oh dear, excuse me again. Uh, yeah, but if anybody wants to put on the comments, like, you know, if somebody just wants to put, you know, oh, fuck you, you know, you know or you're a prick, you don't know what you're talking about, that's fine, you know, I'll probably reply and just say, Cheers. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if somebody just genuinely wants to reply and say, Oh, I, I thought that was an interesting point, or I, or I didn't think I had it, you know, didn't think I was right to say, because I think, like, you know, but then again, I do find it, I do, like I say, I do genuinely, you know, sort of think some comments, like, you know, like when uh, I did a video about um, one of my favourite cinemas, The Savoy, and I, uh, I did like when people have commented, you know, a couple of people have commented on it that, like, you know, sort of, you know, even if they go, oh, that's cinema looks a bit shit. It's like, well, yeah, it does. And it's a bit like with this. If if somebody sort of goes, well, I didn't like this or that, but then it's like, well, I kind of if if, if somebody's got a genuine viewpoint on this, that why what they did like or what they didn't like, then you know, it's kind of like uh, I was because we're getting quite close to the end, but talking about like how it's matter and now, you know you can analyze this film a million ways to Sunday kind of thing. I do kind of like that, like I say, when the, the credits to this film, the making of this on straight after on this videotape, um, uh, the credits for the making of, uh, they're showing you the credits to this being filmed. <laughs> and it's kind of like, say that thing again, where I kind of love that though, that like, like I say, there's all these elements, there's all, uh, there's this thing, because this uh, song here, uh, The World Needs a Malady, George Jones and Tammy Renata, I always, I've, I've listened to it for an awful long time, I always think, this is, this is the thing as well, but this, but this one as well, and again, again, what, what sticks out in people's mind, and what, what, you know, what people go with, and what people won't go with, but I've always found that scene, a little bit weird, where, She's flicking through somebody's second hand porn magazine. Well, it's not like magazine, but second hand porn, but basically she's flicking through somebody's porn mag. Ooh, that's uh, you know, To me, that's more. I'm, obviously, I'm, I'm stressing a point, but to me, that's more like, ew, would anybody do that? Like, you know, than somebody being, you know, schizophrenic and murdering somebody. That's kind of, yeah, that's believable to me. But then a woman looks like quite a respectable woman flicking through an old porn mag. It's their own right. I mean, this bit of like where it changes now, like I say, on a, you know, obviously it's got edge states and stuff before, but wow, I mean, I mean, that's, that's pretty brutal, and that's another thing as well. Is this, uh, is this 15 or 18? Yeah, this is a 15 certificate film, and that's one thing as well. Though I do think it's interesting that nowadays it's become a real big thing on the internet. You can't get away from a remake or a reboot without people going, you know, is it PG-13? Oh, everything should be rated R or 18 in my day. Oh. And it's like, oh, jeez. It's like, this is a 15. And it's like, you know, when you look at some of the elements in this film, you know, some of the weird subject matter it, it deals with, this is a 15. Like, well, what, what do people want? You know, you know, if they'd have had a little tiny bit more gore in and somebody saying the F word just so it could have been 18, 
would it this made this film any more enjoyable, any better? And this is another thing though as well. Like people think like again, same film, shop shop, blah blah blah. Like here, this new Mrs. Bates model. Outstanding. And again, no real need for it to exist, but how cool that somebody got the opportunity to redo this in like just this just the set design here. Anyway, it's perfect. And why is it, and again, why is he got all those live birds there? Does he kill them for stuff? I've literally just thought about that again. I mean, I mean, I've seen this film so many times and never made up on that. Because that's, again, that's even more psychotic than, you know, well, not more psychotic, but, well, if you've got live birds in murder room just so you can tax the you know, that's pretty strange. But what is interesting that, like, again, this music, so iconic, so, you know, the, you know, the, and again, that's another thing, because of films like this, made me think of, um, what film remakes is there that keep music or elements from the original? And you've got this that uses this music, and you've got um, uh, the new Robocop that uses the old Robocop music, or you've got the Get Carter remake, which uses the Get Carter theme. So again, it makes you just think in different ways, and it's kind of an interesting way of thinking. Uh, but I don't know if I said it earlier, but the making of that's on this um, made me realise about, like, say, certain things like. Um, like the music saying the psycho themes in a uh, two four time. Uh, yeah, two four. And um, I never really thought about it before. And it just sort of made, uh, that, that say that's nothing those planes there. They have a F fifteen strike eagles and that plane in Norman Bates' bedroom was um, a bluebird. And again, uh, the pictures are always of birds or bird references. And I kinda love that though that like again little elements like that that like and there's this picture of an island is that like the private island that Marion was talking about like you know and, and things like that so you know it's kind of, and there's Robert Forster there for him and he was in the he was in yeah he's in the black hole right um uh, <laughs> kind of reminds me of that line from Face Bueller just bringing his grandmother in it as well. Just check and see if that is. Um, yeah, Robert Forster. Yeah, so you think he worked with um, Anthony Perkins in The Black Hole and then he's in, I mean, the Psycho remake. I mean, that's pretty... Uh, again, it's uh, you know, you think they could have cast any... I'm just checking there it is. Uh, Robert Forster it must be. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, you think that they could have cast anybody in that role. It was like, let's cast somebody who's worked with Norman Bates. And it's like in the, um, in the series of Bates Motel, the sheriff, the sheriff that plays, from, uh, sheriff, the guy that plays Sheriff from Aero, he looks exactly like um, Norman Bates, and he even says in this joke parody that he looks like um, uh, Anthony Perkins. And again, oh, I've mentioned Romero about ten times during this, that I kind of love how, again, there's just all these little... Just these little, like I say, you know, it is what it is, and you know, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not like I've found, um, you know, I'm not proof string theory to be correct. I don't know what that means, but I've not, um, you know, so it's one of these things where it's like, um, yeah, you know, they are what they are. They're not groundbreaking facts, but nice little, nice little things. I think, you know, just bring a little uh, smile to your face. We you think he literally worked with Anthony Perkins, and he's in the Psycho remake. Cool. But it is interesting as well, because like I say, because I've seen this film so many times. But what is interesting is uh, this is again where I think the, the strength of this remake really works. Is that I think most people, even people who watch the original, would say the one of the clunky elements of the original is in this scene at the end explaining it all. And especially nowadays, because everybody's like amateur psychologists or whatever. But they decided to keep this. This is probably a scene that could have quite easily been just left. And they're like, no, nah, keep it in there anyway. <laughs> Again, it's just that element of keeping the bits in there that don't read. That guy looked like he was from Clockwork Country, can't you? Because he'd be about 137 years old then. Yeah, I think this is the element here where uh, I think they did it earlier on, but I think when you hear the voice of Mother in his, in his head, I, I'm. I think there might be little bits where they've incorporated bits from the original in there, and then, like I say, um, uh, they've got a different... I don't know who plays the actress in this. 
Um, I, I don't know who plays Mrs. Bates in this, although I should do because like I say I've seen it so many times. And then you've got, I think, you've got elements of Vince Vaughn's voice in that. And then I think you, when you see the skull superimposed, I think that might be from the original. So it's kind of like this this quirky thing where, like again, where it's like say even using elements from the original, like not even like say so you go, oh you know. It, it's not the same, but it, it's it's the same. It's kind of like it's using the same elements, so it's like Jesse Scanners. Lines. I'm surprised actually there wasn't some little CGI fly there that that would have that would have really pissed people off. It's like, it's like shots like that. Like they obviously did it in the original, so it's no great kudos or anything. But like, how did they get that fly? Where did they get that fly from? Huh. Yeah, I'm sure you see the you know that's the that, that score is from the original. I don't know if any of these other plates. Um, I don't know I've probably said before, but these number plates. I don't know if any of them mean anything else, like the anal one from earlier on, uh, ANL. And uh, but I don't know if um, nothing's coming to mind. Should have uh, should have done some notes. <laughs> oh, although I did, but you know what I mean. Yeah, but this is what's funny as well because. Um, yeah, like I've said already, but like uh, the original hasn't got credits, so I kind of and I'm I'm one of the few people that watch credits, so it's kind of interesting as Flea's name in the credits. Uh, so I'm one of the few people that watches credits. Um, so to think that like now when I watch the original, I think oh yeah credits. Cause I love this credit roll as well, the way that you see stuff going on in the background and um, uh, this is something kind of. Like if this was on the few times it's ever on TV, they would talk over this and squash the crates and stuff and that. But uh, this kind of just really is a nice slow way of ending the film. And there's the way a little bit of that weird bit of the psycho music creeping in there. Really cool. Uh, and one thing I love about this film as well, again, such a small inconsequential thing, but like how it starts off with that green title, that green square. I don't know why I always find that so fascinating. There, wow, what's that? And then this ends when, when the crates have gone up, the footage still carries on for that guy's name, Pi Griffin. <laughs> I don't know why it's, uh, Peter Griffin would would approve. Yeah, but the um, after the credits finish, the um, the footage carries on for a little bit. And uh, every time uh, I've watched this film, I say I watched it you know, 30, 40, 50 times, whatever, I try and always time, you know, to, not, not, not when necessarily clicking my fingers, but in my mind thinking, when's this footage is going to end? When's this footage is going to end? And there's something quite, it's my, again, my geeky, um, uh, I, I don't know what the uh, element, uh, I don't know what, some kind of mild autism or something, I don't know, but I always kind of just like trying to see when the footage is going to end, even though, like I say, I mean, I, sh- I should be able now offhand. I'll I'll try and click when it ends anyway. I love as well as you know, seeing this is VHS, so it's like standard definition. But I really love if you look into the distance, you can see the cars and trucks getting past in the background. And like I say, you know, when you think of like how much crazy stuff has gone on in this film, of like you know all this murder and all this kind of all this weird stuff and bank robbery, well, you know, thieving and you know, all this kind of weird stuff, and then you know, all this filth masturbating and everything, and you've got like. Just, it's like they're seeing the police cars driving away there, just up the, you know onto the main onto the main highway. You know, and all, it's, it's, it's just a beautiful way to end this movie, really. Again, like I say, I mean, you know, digital. A little bit that for a vague credit, digital assistant. What does that even mean? Are the copter pilots in the start? Peter McKernan and Junior and Senior. Uh, Living Dead Girl, written by Rob Zombie. I like as well. I think it's a special thanks to Pat Hitchcock and the estate of Alfred Hitchcock. Never even got that credit. John Woo for his kitchen knife. Unless it was just his knife, which is no film with Panavision. We've got all the digital sound credits. And, oh, we've got the number for, uh, 35,414 is the NPA number. God, I haven't heard. Here we go. Let's see if we can uh, figure out when this is going to end, everybody. Memory of Alfred Hitchcock? Yeah, thank you. Hitchcock. <laughs> Sounds rude. Here we go. The footage is going. See those trucks moving in the centre of the screen. Oh, there's something just again. I've come And...